Alright everybody, here is Damien Grogiev, the producer of the Break It Down show, coming straight from North Macedonia, that's in Europe. As you know, we passed 1000 episodes, and now on the podcast side, we are almost at 1000, so I really want to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. Go to the website, breakitdownshow.com, and you can find the PayPal link, you can donate us, you can subscribe, you can subscribe on any platform, and you can watch us also on YouTube, you can watch the live streams. We also have some short video segments from our shows, so make sure you check that out. We have new t-shirts, you can find them on the website, that's another way to support the show, so you already know the deal. As part of the Save the Brave supporting comedy shows, today's guest is Carrot Foster. She's a stand-up comedian, she's speaker, television and radio host, and she's so funny. She's not messing around, she worked in the early production of the ABC show The View. She's now the host of the Talkback TV show and she's a recognized public speaker. She speaks about diversity, leadership, women and motivation. Also the amazing Matt Malaker joins me today and trust me we have a great show. You don't want to miss it and also don't forget go to savethebrave.org. Make sure you make a small donation and without further ado here's Carrot Foster. Enjoy. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Kareth Foster, and you're watching Break It Down. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, the Break It Down show. Doing one of our very favorite things to do is the Save the Brave supporting comedy shows. Kareth is a uh, comedian, and that means that I now hand the mic over to Mike Matt Balaker as we try to figure out what's going on this Friday. I'm drinking beers, and that's why I called Matt Mike. <laughs> no problem, Paul. I appreciate it. That's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. I think this is the first time we've had a godmother of a nephew of mine on the show, so... That alone is reason to celebrate, but I could not be more excited to have our next guest. She's a humorist, a comedian, a lecturer, pretty much a 21st century Renaissance woman, a purveyor of joy, happiness, and smiles. The wonderful and talented Kareth Foster is with us today. Thank you guys for having me. What a treat. With you, there's there's so much to cover, and we're, we only have like an hour or so, but I actually never really heard the story, Kareth, of how you got involved in stand up in the first place. Do you mind sharing that? Oh my that? gosh, yeah. So I I I call myself a recovered journalist, right? Because that's what I got my degree in. And I was I went to this really tiny women's college in Columbia, Missouri. I worked for a small ABC affiliate called KMIZ. And guess who one of my coworkers was? Who? Savannah Guthrie of the Today Show. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So we go way back. So I thought, you know what, I'll graduate from my little small school, Stevens College, the second oldest women's college in the country, and I'll go to Mizzou, University of Missouri, where the J school is. But then one of my best friends was working for the Barbara Walters specials and says, hey, Kara, you got to come to New York City. Barbara's starting this new show, and they're looking for people. And I'm like, uh, no, I'm terrified of New York. Don't think so. <laughs> but she's like, you have to do this. She, I think she actually went and bought me the plane ticket. Wow. So I jumped on a plane literally 24 hours later. I interview. I get a call two weeks later saying I got the job. Two weeks later, I find myself on the road to New York City to work for what was then to become The View. It didn't even have a name at the time. So I'm at The View. And the first year was like, I mean, it was ridiculous because we were, it was a brand new startup show. Nobody knew what we were doing. And it was 14, 16 hour days. And I was just, I didn't have an outlet for creativity. I'd had a radio show in college. I didn't have anything going on. And I felt like my soul was dying. <laughs> And I jokingly, you know, when I lecture I, and I tell people about going for your dreams when you know something's a right, good fit or not, you know, for me, it felt like the devil wears Prada. There's a great line in the film where she says, a million girls would kill for this job. Why are you miserable? Yeah. Why were you and, miserable? Right. And I was miserable because I didn't, I wasn't expressing myself like I'd wanted to. And there are no accidents. I'm in the bathroom. Well, we shared a studio space with all my children, the now kind of defunct soap opera. And this girl stops me before I leave. And she's like, hey, can you watch me do my set? And I'm like, you're what? Like, I, I'm like, if anybody stops you in a New York City bathroom and asks you to watch them do something, you run. Don't, yeah. You don't say <laughs> good advice, good advice. what they're talking about. 
But she proceeded to do like six, seven minutes of stand-up comedy. I'm like, how did you learn to do that? Because I always loved it. I used to drag my friends to comedy shows in colleges, but never in a million years was it something that I was going to do. I was not the class clown. I was kind of a goody two-shoes, a little prissy. It was not like in my purview. And I saw her do this and I'm like, well, God, maybe this is the outlet I need. And so she actually had signed up for a class at Gotham Comedy Club and she couldn't take it. And so I treated myself. I was making no money. I was so broke. But for my birthday, I treated myself $300 to a stand-up comedy class at Gotham Comedy Club in New York City. And that was my start. And that was August of 1998. And so what did you take from the class? Like what, what would... What did you find beneficial? Uh, well, just you got to do it. I mean, you're never going to know if you've got the the you know the the guts unless you do it. Like you can talk a good game and you can heckle from the audience, and not that I ever did that, but you know what I mean. Like you can think about it all you want, but until you actually step on that stage, put that mic in your hand, and push past the fear. Now, what's wild is to this day, I probably have two or three jokes from my very first five minute set. Now. Some of them are considered totally politically incorrect at this point. <laughs> you know, 20 some years later, people are like, you can't use that word. You can't say that. <laughs> Not that it was even graphic or gratuitous or racist. It just, you know what I mean? But we're just so, such in such an interesting age now, as you know very well, Matt. Well, that was kind of a nice tease. I mean, to the extent you can, Kareth, what were some of the words or topics that you covered then that? Sure. You don't have to say it if you don't want to, but no, no, no. I mean, well, listen. I mean, because it, 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 I'm actually quoting a real sign, so I guess I can say it because it wasn't my word. There was an ad years ago that the MTA, which is the Metropolitan Transit Authority, right? So the people that run the subways and the buses and all that, that they were running, and on the front was a man wearing uh, wearing a Yankees cap, holding a baseball bat. His name was Tito, and this is how it read. This is verbatim because Tito is 30 years old. Tito lives in a one-bedroom apartment in the Bronx. Tito is mildly retarded. Tito works for the MTA. And my first thought was, oh, my God, how can Tito afford a one-bedroom apartment in New York City <laughs> when I'm still living with my cousin in New Jersey? <laughs> Secondly, every time my train or subway got stuck in a, a tunnel, all I kept thinking is Tito is pushing the buttons and no one's <laughs> stopping him. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of my very first jokes that I ever told on stage. Very nice. So did you keep in touch with that woman who um, auditioned for you in the bathroom? You no, know, it's, it's very sad, actually. Very tragic. She actually committed suicide <laughs> several years. Yeah, not to bring the show down. Not, yeah, thanks. Um, but you know how, like, there's just a lot of messed up people in comedy? You know, they're just people who have issues. And sadly, I think she, you know, has some bipolar stuff going on. And supposedly she got really upset that her real age got put on her IMDB and she was a little bit older than she wanted the industry to know. And that set her off. Wow. So it was really sad. It was very sad to hear that that was what her fate was, but very grateful to her for introducing, you know, for being that connection. That's a crazy story. New York is I got lots crazy of them. Story. What other kind of impossible New York type things have happened along the way? Because, you know, some lady doing stand-up for you in the bathroom who later kills herself. That's one thing, but I'm sure there's more. Oh, God, there's so many. There's so, You know what? I will tell you a great story about stand-up and just the joys that it can bring. You know, because there, listen, doing stand-up, there are times when you're, you know, you're at an open mic and you're paying your dues and there's, you know, it's one o'clock in the morning. There's two people in the audience from Bulgaria who barely speak English and like you are <laughs> trying to make them laugh. And you're like, why am I doing this? Like, what is my purpose in life? I should have gone to med school. <laughs> and then there are times like the one I had, I was doing a, um, it was an all female lineup. I was in New Bud Lake, New Jersey at this uh, place called Pax Amicus Theater. And it looked like a castle on the outside. And during the day, they would have children's theater and puppet shows for kids. And at night, they would put on real theatrical production. And a friend of mine, Jody Wiener, and Wiener is her real last name would produce these shows, she and her husband. And sometimes they'd have like a, a male, a, a woman and a man on, and it would be four comics each. But the beauty about this show was there was no alcohol. So everybody who was there was like laughing because they were feeling it. They weren't buzzed, they weren't, you know. And so everybody was really on their best behavior. And this was a, a ladies night out. 
one. And um, the show was just on fire. It was me, Maureen Langan, Sherry Davy, and Leanne Lord. And afterwards, the you know people were coming up to us like, "Oh, that was so great!" And you know, those you guys were so funny, and you know, the stuff that you like to hear. Like that's part of our payment as comics because we're not making a million bucks a show. And then this one woman makes a beeline to us. It was me and I think Sherry and and uh, Maureen. And the first words out of her mouth were, "My son was killed six months ago." And we're like, oh, my God, like, what? What? Like, we all just kind of lost our breath. At least I did. And then she said, I just want you to know this is the first time I've laughed since. And she think I still get goosebumps and tear up a little bit when I I, I share the story, because like that right there, like that's the payment for all the open mics and for getting screwed by a booker who's supposed to give you 500. He's like, oh, I only have 375. And. You know, like that's the validation of like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I have this gift that I can give to other people who've had horrible, tragic, awful things happen. And for 90 minutes, I can give them a reprieve of that pain. You have 90 minutes? Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do now. I don't know yeah. if I did back then, but you know, yeah. you know, you know, you should have to go longer than 90 minutes. <laughs> You ended up staying in New York beyond that. Like how, so you're at the view, you take this class, you, you, the bug bites you, the stand up comedy bug. How did you then leapfrog to the next step? Well, I was never going to be the starving artist. Like I refused. I, <laughs> you know, I, that was not in my repertoire to, to starve and to scrounge and to, you know, wonder where I was going to get my next paycheck. So I did double duty, you know? I mean, I did leave the view after my second year. I had the summer off and um, I hung out. I used that summer to hang out with Patrice O'Neill and Bobby Kelly and Jim Norton and, you know, Keith Robinson and, you know, all the guys from the cellar and Lisa Lampanelli. And that really is kind of what brought me in to comedy. But my mother at one point was like, please get health insurance. (laughs) So I'm like, all right, I'll start temping. So I started temping at Estee Lauder. And within about a year, I got brought on full time to wow. work there. And they were, I got to tell you that I am so, I feel so fortunate and so blessed. Like everybody there knew what I was doing at night. They support, they came to my shows. They supported me. I had bosses who would let me leave at lunch and go and host stuff at Sirius XM. And have an extended lunch because I also busted my hump at work. So, you know, it wasn't like I was just taking advantage. But they all supported me. And even when I was offered a a chance to climb the corporate ladder and I turned it down because my I knew that wasn't what my heart wanted. I'm not a nine to five or a person. I'll work 80 hours a week for something I love and I do now in my own business. But they they understood. They understood. So I worked full time. Um, I did not sleep. I think I slept three to four hours a night because I would finish my day, you know, at five o'clock and race home. I kept a car in the city like a crazy person. And then I'd hop in the car and drive to Pennsylvania, perform for, you know, 200 bucks, if that, and then drive back home, get home about three in the morning, at least get to bed by three in the morning because you're still high from the the show. And then, and I did it all over again. So I I, I had a double life and people are like, what do you do for fun? I'm like, well, I do comedy for fun, but they're like, but that's kind of your job. I'm like, it is, but it's fun. (laughs) That's the, a good, good light, a uh, good advice. The experience at the view, I mean, getting that understanding that you didn't, you still had the courage to walk up to that mic. You know, it's one thing to want to get into show business or media or whatever, but then you get offered that gig, that chance to build something. You were listing the comedians that you were hanging out with. I know way more of their names than I do the, the producers and the assistants that were at the view. I, I know, I'm sure some careers have been launched, but. That wasn't what your thing was, I don't think. I mean, Barbara Walters is trying to build a big, beautiful machine, but ultimately, you know, the people at the bottom have to work their way up and go somewhere else. And that doesn't seem like that would be in front of the camera somewhere. But it wasn't. Maybe that's not. It's not. I mean, listen, uh, you know, of the friends that I started with, and I actually just spoke with one of them. I, we hadn't talked in 20 years. And I saw it was his birthday on Facebook. And I called him out of the blue. He had the same number. Thank God. And we reconnected and he's now a producer at 2020. I have friends who are executive producers on the Ellen show who started off as PAs on the view, like, you know, low man on the totem pole. Another friend is a um, 
a lecturer and course creator at Stanford. Um, other people are, you know, they're still in media. Some people are still at the view, like one or two people wow. are still there. So it's, you know, it's just the paths that we decide to, to take. But, it, you know, one of the best pieces of advice that my, the woman who hired me said was, first, there's only 30 people in this business and they all know each other. <laughs> Um, so basically it was don't talk shit about anybody because you don't know who you're going to be working with again in the future. And you don't know who's married to who because the women keep their last names and it's very incestuous. Like it's very like, you know, and everybody does know everybody. And that's how you get on to these other shows. Like once you're in, you're in, but it just, it wasn't, it wasn't for me, but I've maintained those relationships. And because of that, some really great things have come. Yeah. Including, well, I don't know if this is from the view, but you, you worked for a a controversial radio host. Can you elaborate on that? I did. Dun, 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 as my six-year-old would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was because of comedy. What's So So I got the Imus gig. That's who you're referring to, Don mm-hmm. Imus, um, who is now uh, deceased. Um, but I got the Imus gig because I performed at a comedy club in New Jersey. It was actually, it was like 40 minutes outside of the city. Killed it killed it and the guy never booked me again <laughs> <laughs> you were jealous and seven years later it's and that's like the how comedy works the business you're like what i but i just did you see the audience they love me and and then you know whatever well first of all there was the the i i, I call it nappy gate right when i must recall uh called the rutgers women's basketball team nappy headed hoes so nappy gate happened in april of 2007 and in september of 2007 I get a call from this booker who had booked me seven years previously, never talked to me again and said, Hey, you interested in a, you know, radio TV opportunity. Now I'm in Kansas city at the time headlining what used to be Stanford, Stanford and sons comedy club. And I'm like, yeah, sure. What's up? Yeah, of course. He goes, Oh, so just so you know, it's with Don Imus. And I'm like, Oh, nappy headed hose Don Imus. (laughs) He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. He goes, how soon can you meet with him? I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm in Kansas City. I'm headlining. I'm done on, you know, Sunday, but I'm going to Texas. He's like, can you not go to Texas and come back to New York? So I knew it was serious. So I changed my ticket and I come back. And that, I think Monday or Tuesday, I met with Don. I was at his home office. Wow. And sitting face to face with one of the most reviled men in media. <laughs> But you know what? And I, I shared this. Well, I didn't share this in my TEDx talk, but I did share it in my book. Like, you know, as a comment, knowing that when you're trying to be funny, when you're trying to riff and say something off the cuff, like if you really go back and watch the tape or listen to the tape, those weren't his words. I mean, yes, they came out of his mouth, but he was parroting his producer, Bernie McGurk, who's you know also not a bad dude. They were trying to be funny, right? The only problem is it was just a really poor choice of words. It thrust a group of young women who did not ask to be put in the spotlight into a spotlight. And it was it was really derogatory comments that I don't think either of them knew the weight of. And so it was the perfect storm, you know, old, rich, white celebrity says something horrible and, you know, and it was a slow news day. These kind of stories often happen because we don't take the time to listen to the whole tape and go, oh, that's regrettable, but this is not what we're regrettable is not racism you know it's like well, yeah, poor on purpose. that was worse you know what i mean like that right. was nothing compared to some of the stuff he intentionally said yeah <laughs> right or that or the person reporting about it has intentionally said you know like about things i mean that when that alec baldwin tape broke about him hollering at his daughter it's like if you recorded everything i said or anybody said and you <laughs> picked it crap oh my god i'd be a monster you know but the don imus's job is to get people to pay attention and so he does skirt the line and then if he does the show for a whole year how many times does he ever even step over the line his job is to walk on it and he's, he was really damn good at that he listen the man was a genius and what's so tragic is that he was just such a damaged person he was so smart and he could be so funny but he he had his demons you know i mean he was an addict and an alcoholic who Sadly, never got recovery. He he stopped drinking and he stopped doing drugs, but he never did the 12 steps or anything. And he used to he re- even referred to himself as a dry drunk. So you never knew who you were going to get day to day. And it was like constantly walking on eggshells. And I always said, if I ever had bipolar twins, I'd be prepared. <laughs> How long did you work 
at the IMS show? So I was there from 2007 to 2009. I was there for two out of the three years of my contract. And you know, obviously he's, he's passed, but how would you categorize your experience there? I mean, it, it helped catapult you in some ways, but it wasn't all peaches and cream. Like. I, I, another reference, not necessarily a movie reference, like Devil Wears Prada, but I, uh, my Charles Dickens reference, I, my tale of two cities. I, I say it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Because it was, it was a dream job. I mean, here I was kind of full circle back into journalism in a way, Mm -hmm. you know, radio, TV. I got to talk news of the day and incorporate the comedy and be funny. And, you know, and and I also kind of was laden with this incredible responsibility to be the anti-stereotype of what we typically see of Black women in the media which there wasn't much of, you know, Oprah no longer had her daily show. She hadn't started her network yet. There was no Shonda Rhimes or Kerry Washington or Viola Davis. Not that those three women or four of them, you know, represent all that could be represented. Um, So this was my chance to speak to an audience who probably never interacted with anyone like me before. (laughs) What is the stereotype for a black woman in your business at that time? What was it? Um, Loud crass, you know, neck rolling, talking about baby daddies and getting high and, you know, being big and boisterous and outrageous and, you know, like uh, Monique, you know, not that, you know, to throw shade on her because she's a very talented comedian, but that's, you know, it, like the, 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 the Apollo set, the, 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 you know, the, they call it the Chitlin circuit. Right. And, and it was, and I think that's also why I did, have challenges getting representation in the business because I didn't fit that stereotype. And honest to God, because bookers and managers are so unimaginative (laughs) and with agents, they didn't know what to do with me. You know, I wasn't this cute little blonde who talked dirty. I wasn't an Amy Schumer. I wasn't a, you know, I wasn't a Monique. I wasn't a Samore. What do we do with Kara? She's, we've never seen anything like this. Although you were a Huxtable for a while. Can you talk about that? <laughs> That's one of my jokes. Yeah. I So when I, and this still happens a little bit, not as much anymore, but you know, I get on stage and people stare at me like that hair, that ass, those are definitely black, but that voice, no, not so much. <laughs> and then I explain, you know, listen, you guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. I go, but I, I, just, I can't help it. This is who I am. You know, I'm Lisa Turtle from Saved by the Bell. <laughs> Or Hillary from the Fresh Prince of Bel Air Black. <laughs> and I did. I used to say I was a Huxtable um, until people started thinking my dad tried to roofie my Girl Scout tree. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped that line. Thank you, Mr. Todd. I love that joke. It always cracks me. <laughs> it's so wrong. Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> what is it? I, I'm going to ask because I don't know. What is it about black folks when you aren't black enough or if you do well and i can't think of a put down that that is applicable in another way than calling someone an uncle tom like just because they're successful or just because you disagree with them politically like it's such a horrible thing to do to somebody to call them that you know to dismiss their years of work and you know their success just i i i just can't think of what it is there must be something that we say in another way that's similar, but it just is such an ugly term. And it's so dismissive to something that I think we're all trying to figure out how to do a better job at than you see the community doing it to itself. Yeah. You know? well, it, listen, it's been a struggle my my entire life. You know, I've, I've kind of dealt with this. It's almost like being caught between two worlds, right? Where I wasn't black enough for some people. I wasn't, you know, I certainly wasn't white. Because of that, I had to learn early on that my identity didn't revolve entirely around my skin color, you know, nor should it, nor should it for anyone. And that's actually part of the messaging that I take in the work that I do in the diversity and inclusion realm. You know, I right now am revolutionizing how we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, not only because it's been done so poorly for so long, but we still need to address things, but we need to do it in a new way that's really truly inclusive of everyone. Because you know, to say you're only diverse if you're a person of color or you're a woman, or you're part of the LGBT plus community or different able, like that's bullshit. Like everybody belongs in this conversation. And it's it's so counterintuitive to say, let's talk about diversity and inclusion, but we're just going to focus on what separates and divides us. <laughs> right? 
and you're in this group and you're in this cut and you're in that. And if you don't understand what these people are going through, then you're horrible and you're evil. And I'm, you know, are in this category, then you're marginalized and you're this. And you know, I'm so done with the, the victimization and the vilification. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that your know, racism and sexism and homophobia and anti-Semitism, I'm not saying those things don't exist. They certainly do. But if we're going to really address it, really tackle it in a way that gives everybody a voice and a part in the conversation, then we have to stop with the division. Mm-hmm. And again, that goes back to our identities and how we identify. And we need to really rethink what it, it like who we are. Are we our money? Are we our education? Are we our skin color? Are we our, just our gender or our sexual preference? No, we're multifaceted. We're not monoliths. And for people to be able to accept that, I think for some people it's a stretch. For some people it's incredibly freeing. But I think there are a lot of people who've never even thought beyond what they've been told to think of themselves. That's a very interesting point. Like, I think, did you trademark inversity? I did. Yeah, it's, I, I want you to unpack it for us, but you started Stereotype 101 mm-hmm. Inversity. It's kind of in line with what you're talking about, but please like illuminate the, the millions of listeners out there on, on what this sure. is. <laughs> I love it, millions. Um, so yeah, I just, I mean, the idea for me was to, Even the word diversity, right? You look at the word, the root of it is divide and division. And we're never going to get to where we want to be if that's where we keep focusing. It's like the law of attraction, right? What you put your energy and attention toward, you get more of. Mm -hmm. So let's stop focusing on what separates and divides us. And let's focus to what I call inversity, which is what do we have in common? How can we be truly inclusive of one another? But most importantly, and this is really the most critical aspect is, How can we be introspective, meaning understanding your value, your worth, your connection to humanity? Because when you can see those things in yourself, that's when you can then see them in someone else. And I think that's really the key to kind of like flipping the switch on all of this, because so many people are unhappy. They don't treat themselves well. They don't understand their own value. So how could you possibly expect them to see it in somebody else or treat someone else well or be respectful of someone else? So while we've been trying to work from the outside in for all of these years, these decades, right? Let's work from the inside out. And then how we treat ourselves will be reflected in the world around us. That's a great point. It's one of the things I like to say about diversity. One, it's not just black people and white people. It's a lot of things. Like if you're going to have a diverse workplace, I should see a veteran because I'm a veteran. You should see veterans. You should see young people and old people, companies that don't hire anybody who's over mm-hmm. 50. You know, all of these different elements. And the other thing is, is the antonym of diversity is unity. So you don't get to have both of those things working together, you know. So <laughs> we have COVID, which we're struggling with because we are a diverse country. Right. And you, we look at, we point to Finland or New Zealand and they're like, look how good they've done. Like, but they're much more unified. They're a homogenous. They are. Group. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question. Same with Australia. And I think you actually just, Pete, made a really brilliant point. You know, diversity. And that's why I like university so much better because diversity is so broad, right? I mean, you're talking about like, you know, like people's ages and their, 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 their politics and their, their religions and their this. I mean, and it's, you know, there's also diversity of thought, which what? needs to be part of it. Because I know, I know, man, you have to cut me off. <laughs> Not on college campuses, young lady. This is our world. I know. Yeah. So it is, that's what kills me is that that's being shut down right now and trampled on. It's like, how are you going to grow as a person and a human being? If you're not open to having other ideas put on your plate and table, it doesn't mean you have to accept them, but just to take them in and let them marinate and either be strengthened in your convictions or, you know, maybe be introduced to something new. It's this whole, uh, again, back to the diversity idea. We want diversity, but you damn well better think like I think. Otherwise, your values, I'm going to devalue you, you know, and so we go back to this prejudicial loop. Remember when prejudice and stereotyping was a bad thing to do to people, you know, and now like I can be assigned values and a policy position based upon how I appear to somebody. (laughs) It's just like the craziest. It's the best way to piss everybody off. That's really what that is. (laughs) And I think you're wrong. (laughs) 
<laughs> Kareth was. Let's the, go back to comedy, Matt. To ask some comedy questions so we can talking about diversity for a minute. Okay. Obviously, we met in LA. So I, I'd like to get your take, Kareth, on the scene. You, you were in New York for years, then LA, and you've traveled the country. How would you compare and contrast the coasts and the flyover states? Oh, wow. You know, I mean, I've been really blessed to have done comedy from Washington State to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, the number one rule in comedy, well, I guess first off is be funny, right? But truly, it's know your audience. And I don't think you're going to really know your audience unless you are in front of them and you have traveled the whole country. And there is a different vibe on the coast without question. What was really fascinating for me was, you know, coming to L.A. from New York. I mean, I, I started comedy in New York and thank God I did because I probably would have been too chicken to have started anywhere else and then migrated to New York. like. Mm -hmm. Ignorance is bliss, right? Oh. I had no idea who I was hanging out with. I mean, I knew I was hanging out with him, but, you know, I, I didn't know who Patrice was. I mean, I did, but I didn't, you know, and then I was his co-host on the Black Phillips show, which is so funny because I, I get people who are just discovering him. There's a lot of teenagers and like college kids and they're like, Patrice was amazing and I loved you. And, you know, and they'll leave these like random comments on my website, but there's just different energies in different parts of the country. And I certainly have jokes that I modify based on where I am in the country, whether it's in the South the North or East or West. And I feel like, you know, because I've traveled the country and done comedy in so many places and for so long, you know, I should have an honorary psychology, sociology, and anthropology degree. <laughs> but I think that's also really what, you know, gives me that extra boost with the work that I do, you know, with the, the diversity stuff, you know, as far as having these conversations and knowing how to have them. I mean, you have to know your audience and how to talk to people. And that with comedy, you have to know how to get people on your side within seconds. Otherwise, you are in for a shit time on stage. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm just adjusting my lighting here as, as we go. For those few out there who haven't seen Can We Take a Joke, it's a documentary starring Kareth Foster. Came out in 2015, I believe, where free speech is the issue, but also on free speech specifically on college campuses. And I've been really impressed with not only what you did on the documentary, but what you've done from it or since then. Um, please let us know kind of how you took that and springboarded to some of the cool stuff you're doing now. Well, that's honestly, this goes back to you, my friend, because oh, thank you. I, no, really, truly, uh, if you and I had met and we met through an ex-boyfriend of mine, did you know that he was my ex? I did after I knew you for like three years. <laughs> you didn't know that beforehand? <laughs> it took a while. Although he, when he, he, you came, I thought, I'll be quick. I thought you just wanted to like watch the show. You know, just kind of like get an idea of the, this right. red show I used to host. And this guy, Steve, who's very mild mannered, really smart. Super nerdy. I like him a lot, but just kind of, you know, a bit of an odd duck in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she is a big deal and like was so serious about it. And I was like, okay, he's never set, acted like this before. So I, I brought you up and you were fantastic. So that wow. was. Oh my God. That's so funny. I, did, I didn't know he said that about me. Yeah. That was, that's, a, that's another story for off camera. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so we, yeah, that was my ex. And um, and so I met you and absolutely like just had the best time doing your show. And then I met your brother and sister-in-law who instantly became family. And, and then we actually became family because we're godparents all around now. And they asked me to be in their documentary. Can we take a joke? And I was so honored because of the work, you know, that I did as a comic on, on stages. But I, you know, and as a comic and as a journalist and as somebody who just, is such a proponent for free speech to to understand more clearly what threat was underway on college campuses where again you know this is supposed to be where you're growing and learning and exploring and expanding your horizons um and to hear that you know so many comics didn't want to do it anymore and 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 it was you know becoming kind of a lost art because everybody was getting offended you know well you can't say that because my cousin's uncle's nephew is a gay muslim and it's like what we're not even, first of all, that's like six degrees of separation and you're offended. Okay. And gay Muslims are the coolest. So they. Right. Actually, one of my very dear friends is a gay Muslim. <laughs> Urshad Manji. She's amazing. And she's such a free speech advocate too. She's amazing. She wrote a book called Don't Label Me. But so like the idea, like to be able to be part of a project that really kind of took to task like what's happening on campuses across the country and 
and have the opportunity to have. And it was such a well done film. Courtney and Ted just, they killed it. And it just received such great accolades. And, you know, it was shown at the museum before it closed and, and it garnered a lot of really great attention. And it also really spurred me to start the nonprofit that I created called Frame. It's now called Frame, which stands for Foster Russell Alliance for Meaningful Expression. And our mission is to take programming, educational programming that promotes free speech, inclusion, and social change to university and college campuses. Wow. Take us through that because, you know, I've, it's been a few years since I've been on a college campus, Pete as well. <laughs> well, you know, we, we see the headlines. And I remember back when I was a student, there were like the ones that made the noise. And then there were the 90 plus percent that were somewhere in the middle, you know, and I, I was kind of one of those. What is it like now? Because I really, I really don't know. So it's interesting, obviously, right now, right now, everything is virtual. But I did something for a very well-known school. It's actually, and the school itself, if they could have planned for coronavirus any better, I don't know how, because they actually do everything online. The exception of the first year, everybody's there in person on, on in San Francisco on campus. And then they go off to their corner of the world or wherever they want to live and take classes online. Excuse me, it's called Minerva Schools. And it was founded by a gentleman, a brilliant man by the name of uh, Ben Nelson. He's a CEO. And I've spoken with them several times and they brought me on this year to do their foundation. And to talk about with the entry entry class about you know what's going on and 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 with diversity and, and inclusion and but how you know we can keep these conversations going because it's so important and that's part of the programming right that frame does because it is about how we frame society and and our parts in it and our roles in it and how we we re- reframe situations. I use humor because I will always be a comedian at heart. And I use humor and a lot of the work that I do because I think it's a it's such a it creates such a neutral space, mm-hmm. right? For people who typically will come in either on the offense or the defense, just depending on where they're coming from. And it, it neutralizes everything so that they're open. And, and we also know, like as comics, like laughter has a, a a physiological effect on you. It relaxes you. It fires off certain neurons. So you're a bit more open to to hearing things and new ideas. You're a bit more accepting. I have a joke about, uh, you know, just the struggles that I've faced from growing up being, you know, one of the only black people in my classes ever until even sophomore year of college. And I even talk about struggling with my weight. And the joke that I shared was how I'm okay with who I am as I am now. And, you know, I've matured and that's helped. I said, but it depends on where I'm geographically, how other people see me. (laughs) Because in New York City, I'm pleasantly plump. In LA, I'm a beached whale, but in the Midwest, I'm anorexic. <laughs> and it is awesome. <laughs> and if you're ever having a fat day, you buy yourself a one way ticket to Kansas City. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you'll feel like a supermodel like that. <laughs> and the follow up to the joke is you know, there's a bit more in there, but the, the end of it is I said, you know, what's wild is, you know, in this country, we don't only really have fat people and fat little kids. They go, we have fat pets now, y'all. Like, <laughs> I have a friend who has a cat that weighs 22 and a half pounds. And if that doesn't make your mouth drop open, let me put it to you this way. That's four bags of sugar with paws. <laughs> I said, now the only reason we don't weigh this much is because my friend had to take it to the vet because it was limping. Right? Now I assumed it was being crushed under its own weight. But it turns out it was much more sinister. It was actually quite sad and tragic. Somebody had shot it. Now, it was fine. The cat lived. It was, you know, please don't call PETA on me. I didn't do it. I said, but, you know, at 22 and a half pounds, I told my friend, I'm like, listen, sweetheart, at that size and that weight, somebody probably thought it was a fucking wildebeest. (laughs) And I got a letter from the school from someone who, like, apparently it was, like, all buzzed around. That said, I was fat cat shaming. <laughs> Are you serious? That's when I hilarious. thought I heard it all, you guys. When I thought I heard it all, fat cat but, shaming. Now I've heard That's people say about the whole eating. You know the oh. uh, in, you know Midwest I'm anorexic. Well, I was bulimic in high school. My sister had an eating disorder, and I'm like, no, I'm sorry to hear that. I wasn't mo- making fun of you. I was talking about me, and it was a joke. <laughs> but fat cat shaming that took the cake. <laughs> But then in that same day, about three hours later, I received, a, and it's a very international school. I received an email from a gentleman who will remain anonymous, 
from Pakistan who said, I want to thank you. He goes, I don't know if you've heard that, you know, people have been buzzing about what you said and this, because it was, I guess it became like a deal with them. He goes, but I want to thank you so much for using your humor. He goes, and I appreciate your stance on free speech because where I come from, we don't have that. Yep. They legit don't have it. Like we <laughs> want to get, you know, our panties and no all hyperbole all. with what he's saying. <laughs> no, yeah. there was no hyperbole. Like he meant it. And he like it, it, so it was almost like, do you here in America really even understand like what we have that you're willing to put at risk because you've gotten offended because you either didn't get a joke or you didn't agree with it? But it, you're still giving and ha- letting somebody have the ability and the right to say that. And that doesn't mean I support hate speech as a free speech advocate, but I also know that the only way to combat hate speech and bad speech is with more and better good free speech. <laughs> well, and let hate speech be the terrible thing that it is, you know, like let it, yeah. let it be in the light so you can be yeah. like, that's horrible. Exactly. Know? Let me see who you are, right? Because yeah. when these people go underground, that's when we're in trouble. Absolutely. We Thank had you. Daphne Maxwell read on the show. She was Vivian number two on the first Yes, show. I love her. And she's so great. And I said, what are your thoughts on Bill Cosby? She said, he is my friend, you know, because he, I've known him for decades. And she also knows his legacy in the town, you know, what he's done for the access for black folks who want to act, how to manage money. And there's so many stories where like Bill Cosby taught me how to do this. You know, he normalized this. It, Yes, it was a black family on the Cosbys, but it really didn't matter, you know, because he was so good at that. So you can't can't just look at the bad side of the scale and dismiss it. She's like, yeah, he did horrible things, and those are bad. However, there's a whole lot of good on the other side. You have to balance the scale. Nobody, again, it's back to this being a monolith, right? If he was a completely <laughs> awful, horrible, evil person, he would have never gotten as far as he did. Yeah. And let's be honest, you know, what he did was horrible. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we're, not about it. No, we're not arguing about it. <laughs> there are other people in Hollywood who do just as horrible things, if not worse. We just don't hear about it. It's this this really kind of wild world that we have to figure out, you know, how we classify people. Can you separate the artist from the art? Mm-hmm. The cat shaming from the joke. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> so I, what's it like teaching? Uh, well, I'll preface this. I'm super impressed, Kareth, with how, how you constantly reinvent what you're doing. Whether it's a pandemic or not, you go from like comedian to humorist. And now I, I follow you online and, and you're this lecturer at Stanford, among other places. How'd you get into that? And what's that like? It's awesome. I love it. And it's, you know, what's so cool is that everything that I've done, Matt, from the very beginning, even from the journalism degree, right? It's all just kind of snowballed and accumulated. And and trust me, there were times when I was working that nine to five office job and I'm like, why am I here, God? What is going on? Why am I in HR? This is not my life's purpose. And now I speak to corporations (laughs) because I'm, you know what I mean? And I have that background. So I know what they need and I know how to talk to them. So it's one of those, you know, everything for a reason, Mm -hmm. right? And it's all of the pieces have kind of come together. And it's a beautiful thing. And I, you know, the reason I lecture at Stanford is, again, going back to The View, my friend um, who I stayed in touch with was created this course and called Reputation Management for the Graduate School of Business. And (laughs) she thought, well, why don't you come in and talk about, you know, having to save Don Imus's reputation and then ultimately having to save your own. And I did. And I thought it was just a one-off thing, but every year I got voted favorite speaker. And so I've been back like eight years in a row. Wow. And because of my success with that, and one of the other people who was, you know, part of that in that faculty, that person became the head of the Knight Hennessy Scholars Program, which is Stanford's equivalent of the Rhodes Scholars. And they brought me in to be a luminary and to have office hours and be a lecturer for the it actually happened in January of last year. So thank God it happened before. <laughs> you know, COVID has, but so it's, you know, and I, another thing I'll be, you know, I'm just open, you know, I'm really open to the universe and now to where I'm being led and I'm using my intuition. I'm using my skills and I'm, I'm following my passion and my passion really is, and it's always been the same. It's never, it's never diverted. My passion is to bring people together. Mm-hmm. And while it was just, you know, comedy, it was through laughter, right? 
Now it's through, you know, we are so divided. We've got such polarization happening in this country. We are pit against each other intentionally on a regular basis. What can I do to, to help heal? And so it's, you know, I just, again, I feel so fortunate and so blessed to not just have these gifts, but the ability to, and the spaces to, to plug in and use them. Absolutely. Spoken like a true luminary. I, I noticed behind you, Kareth, you have a book. I do. <laughs> last night I read 101 Ways for a Great Laugh, which I really enjoyed, but I, I want to... <laughs> um, this is an awesome book, can you, but can you talk about it, please? Sure. So this this is, uh, you can be perfect, you can be happy, which I just happen to have right beside me, actually, because I have to sign it and get it out. I wrote this book. It started, the idea for it came years ago. I just had my first daughter, and who's now eight, and she was a lot smaller than we had anticipated. She was <laughs> four pounds, 10 ounces, even though the midwife and the pediatrician, like the OBG, rather, was saying, oh, she's going to be six, six and a half pounds, which, I, you know, I was a small baby. And uh, we had her and she was this tiny and she wasn't latching. I was trying to nurse and I didn't know she wasn't latching until a few days later when she's just dropping weight, dropping weight, which when she was getting nothing, basically, like she could have died. And I, we didn't realize this till the midwife because the doctor was of no use. The doctor was like, oh, babies lose a little weight when they're born. Okay. <laughs> when you're four pounds, 10 ounces, you can't afford to go down to three pounds, 18 ounces. You know what I mean? Like, come on. So, um, or, you know, 14 ounces. So I, we go to the midwife and the midwife grabs some breast milk from another mom from the fridge and put a tube into my kid's mouth. And it was literally like watching a black and white TV turn color. <laughs> And it was like, oh my God, my kid was dying. And I beat myself up like nobody's business. And anybody who's a parent, man or woman, I don't care who you are, you know, like, it's like that, like that meme, you've got one job. <laughs> and that one job is to keep this person alive, <laughs> at least till 18. <laughs> yeah, then they're on their own. But yeah. okay, you're, you're good. I, I did what I could for you. And so, you know, in the midst of just beating myself up terribly, one of my best friends who shares a birthday with me came up to visit and she said, look, Kara, here's the thing. You can be happy or you can be perfect. I choose happy. And while the heavens should have opened up and a chorus of angels should have sung, it was just like, oh, what a nice thing for my friend to say to make me feel better. But that stayed in my head. And I, I flipped it around a little bit to you can be perfect, you can be happy. But I thought about it more and more like, yeah, you can be perfect or you can be happy. And then I realized how much of my life I'd spent trying to be perfect, right? The perfect friend, the perfect daughter, the perfect student, the perfect employee, the perfect comic, like all this stuff, all this time, all this energy. And to what avail? You know, what was that actually costing me? And it was costing me time. It was costing me energy. It was costing me money in some circumstances. And it was costing me joy and happiness. And that was a really big wake up call for me. Cause I'm like, if I'm doing this, then there's gotta be a bunch of other people doing this too. Um, and so that's why I was like, I gotta get this book at. And the, the tenets of the book are, you know, getting back to the basics. And I've created several speaking programs around it and a coaching program. Um, one of the speaking programs is, you know, uh, the gift of gifts, get your shit together. <laughs> G-Y-S-T. <laughs> Sometimes people just need to hear that, right? Or you're in that boat, like, I just got to get my shit together. And while I'm not the expert or claim to be or a therapist or anything like that, um, but having experienced it, I, I do feel like I can speak from that place. And as somebody who's constantly, you know, working on herself and improving and has had some modicum of success, I, I feel like I can share. Thank you for sharing it. <laughs> Thank you. Do you think you're a good mom now? Or are you oh, still pretty hard on yourself? I think you know, especially the people who are like, I don't, I don't know if I'm doing this right. They're usually the ones who are doing it pretty good. It's the people who are like, I got this down. Mopping <laughs> is so easy. I don't have to. No, honey, no. You need to. <laughs> you need to read the room and do a self check. How um, old are your kids? They're eight and six. Oh my gosh! Tell you something. You are not a real parent until you have accidentally killed one of your children's pets. Okay. <laughs> I don't care how many cesareans you had, how many hours of labor you were in. You do not know the pain of parenthood till that gerbil is faced <laughs> up, stiff as a board, and you're doing 
CPR chest compressions, <laughs> contemplating mouth to snout, okay? Mm. <laughs> well, let me just tell you, it gets worse because you don't control <laughs> how your kid is, who your kid is. And there'll be the, these things that are in chapter 920 in the parent book. And you're like, but my book goes to chapter four. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> it's like, what, what on earth is this nonsense that I'm supposed to know how to deal with? You know, and there's literally like, you have to breathe through it. You have to drink and go for a walk with your significant other and then come to this conclusion. There is no good answer. We're just going to have to pick something and do that. <laughs> Listen, you know what? I mean, our theory is they're going to be in therapy for something. You know, yeah. at yeah. this point, they're going to be in therapy for something. And, you know, let it be for us being, you know, too parenty or too, like, too strict or too, mm -hmm. you know. But it's funny because so Matt knows my husband. My husband's Australian. Which means he has no filter whatsoever. <laughs> He's as Australian as they come. And I'm a comedian. So these poor kids, I mean, they're <laughs> funny as hell. They're really funny. Um, they have a great sense of humor. Um, the other day I was, uh, so we're homeschooling. Like we're officially homeschooling. I think the, the line is it, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a, a, a winery to homeschool one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. And we were like wrapping up with the day and the kids were like, Hey, can we watch a little TV? I'm like, sure, go ahead, whatever. And I'm cooking dinner. And I hear the older one, the eight year old say to the six year old, Hey, Sissy, let's watch something with famous people. And the little one goes, yeah, rich and famous people. <laughs> and the older one goes, Sissy, everybody who's on TV is rich and famous. And I'm like, Hey guys, you know, mommy, mommy's on TV. And I have, I've been on TV probably more than I watched it this year. And I go, am, am I famous? You know, I'm, I'm on TV. And then my older daughter goes, um, are you on Muppets now? Ooh. <laughs> I'm like, did you? I, no. I go, no, that, no, I'm not. She goes, then I'm sorry. I'm like, okay, I will remember this. And it's, you know, the horrible thing is you can't ground anybody right now anyway. <laughs> we're all grounded. <laughs> yeah. They're we're just, all grounded. I, I love when I hear like these great stories about these moms. Like I think Miranda Lambert was one recently. Where like the kids at school away from mom, you know, and and the teachers like tell us what your mom's favorite hobby is. And, you know, it's Miranda Lambert or you know whoever it is, someone super famous like doing the laundry. That's her hobby. <laughs> <laughs> it cracks me up. It's so funny. <laughs> Feeding yeah. the cat. You know, they're so funny. They're so funny. Yeah. So have have you had any parents? I guess when they're in school. Or, or teachers reprimand them for for their free speech advocacy. And their Australianness. <laughs> well, okay. you know, so they were in Montessori school, and then when everything happened last year, they weren't. Mm -hmm. So we've literally been doing homeschool. Like we're legit homeschool. Not even like with other teachers. Like it is me and the Aussie. So or you. Yeah. So the reprimanding has been coming from us. Like, I can't believe you said that. Well, no. So, you know, and my husband will do most of it because I'm upstairs, you know, in the office giving presentations and working and marketing and all that stuff. And the other day I, I hear, because I'm upstairs and I hear, mm, there it is. Mm, mm, mm. And I'm thinking, they're saying, ooh, there it is. Like, oop, there it is. Like the song. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, they were actually singing, poop, there it is. Poop, because they had to pick a word and then write it in a sentence. Sure. And the word they picked was poop. So uh, I'm like, okay, great. I six and eight. I think there's no better word. No, no. We're at that age where yeah, you know, poops are funny, farts are hysterical. I know your boys think that. Yes, they do. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I just keep thinking this too will pass. This too will pass. Probably not. Well, maybe the girls. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I hope it does. <laughs> I have no hope for my sons. They'll they'll be 35. Go, ah. Right, right. <laughs> I'm very proud. Speaking of uh, terrifying parent things, I've had a lot of people on the show say, and then my, my father said to me, or my mother said to me, and it's these like eight words out of 50 million words. We all have these statements that your parent says something to you and you're like, ow. That's going to hurt the rest of my life, you know, and it's, it's simple things, you know, like when someone says you'll never amount to nothing, you know, you're, you're, or your dad says you're worthless and stupid and you're like, oh, okay, I believe you, you know, <laughs> like you can say the simplest thing to your kid in a moment of, of weakness or whatever it is, and it will absolutely stick to them, 
you know, and with you and your husband being as verbose and, and funny and everything else, you just never know when that bomb is going to go off. But all of us have that happen. Yeah. Be in therapy for something. Right. We try to be really cognizant of our words. We try to, you know, use them wisely. We try to, you know, whenever they say can't, we like we say you can't say can't in this word in this house. Like that's not a word we use. And, you know, our kids have such an incredible vocabulary. And I don't know if it's because I'm so verbose because I'm a speaker. Like you know, when my little one was little, my older one was little, she'd say, you know, instead of I need water, she's like, daddy, I need to hydrate. I need to hydrate. And the six-year-old the other day was trying to show her sister something. She's like, let me demonstrate. I want to demonstrate it for you. Not I'll let me show you. Yeah. But then, you know, I, I'll, I'll never forget being, I had one of them in the car. They were in their little car seat and we were in traffic. And I know it was my husband who planted the seed because I don't talk that way, but we somebody cut me off. I was like, oh, I can't believe it. And my little one goes, mommy, was that a dickhead? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 honey, that was that was a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> so they do, they pick up on what you say. And so we do have to be careful with the messaging and just distribute as much love as possible. Oh yeah. Well, you're doing a great job with that. Thank you. <laughs> dickheads and all. <laughs> hey, there's always gonna be dickheads around us. You gotta learn how to navigate. <laughs> I wanted to jump in here real quick and just mention the fact that the reason why Matt and I are doing this is because Bastards Canteen is part of the Save the Brave family. And this episode is, is brought to you by Save the Brave. Obviously, it's Break It Down show. But if there wasn't a pandemic, we'd already be doing this. But we're going to be doing comedy shows at Nick's Canteen, Bastards Canteen in Temecula once his performance stage is open. So everybody, we're, we're doing these, kind of just priming the pump, bringing comedians on. Matt knows so many of them. And it's been so great to do this. So when you guys are watching this, if you want to support Save the Brave and you're in Temecula, of course, come down any night because there should be something live going on but in particular on the comedy nights so you can see people like Kareth when she's in town and available and willing but you know I just I appreciate Matt for setting these things up and I appreciate you for coming on and sharing your time and I'm not trying to close the show down I just got to make sure I say yeah, those words done. yeah yeah because that's why we're doing this and and as soon as God, as soon as we can get out and see real comedy shows again, you know, I'm super excited to see you if you're going to be on the road or, you know, whoever it is that's going to be doing their five to five minutes to 90 minutes. You know, we all need some some comedy. We all need to be shown how ridiculous we are, by the way. Too. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, we need more of that. Well, I love being on here and I appreciate what you're doing. I, I also want to thank you for, you know, trying to keep comedy alive because, you know, it's not just comedy for the you know for the masses comedians need to do it too i mean this is a lot of people's lifeblood because we enjoy you know sharing and making people laugh and, and hearing it it's cathartic and it's healing all around absolutely yeah yeah for sure for sure matt anything in closing where can we learn more about kareth if we want to buy your books hire you for lots of money <laughs> <laughs> So my website, I very fortunately received the name from my parents of Kareth. There are not too many other Kareths out there. And Kareth.com is my website. My email is actually Kareth at Kareth.com. <laughs> and my last name is Foster. So a lot of my handles are at Kareth Foster. So on Instagram, although on Facebook, it's at Foster Kareth. That's my fan page because my personal page is like totally full, which is crazy. I should probably just switch over to a fan page, but. Anywho, and yeah, you can get my book on Amazon. You can be perfect. You can be happy, which I just saw Todd DeVoe is on here saying he got a copy for his wife for Christmas, which is so cool. And yeah, I, I mean, I'm I, I'm on Twitter. I, not so much. I mean, I try to put it all <laughs> in one place, right? Yeah. But, so Facebook, Instagram are probably the best places to follow me. Every now and then I'll put some funny stuff on Twitter as well. But Instagram, I just posted a picture. Well, I haven't put it on Instagram yet. It was on Facebook. My husband, so, you know, we did the Elf on the Shelf for Christmas. And as you all know, that can be quite tedious. But my husband it was very dedicated and took care of it. The girls were just so excited every morning to see what this elf did. And he did some very Australian things. Let's just say that. I caught him in a couple scenarios with the LOL dolls, <laughs> some beer. That's all I'm going to say. And <laughs> so after Christmas was over, which I'm like, oh, thank God, no more of that. We had baby Yodas. And these baby Yodas, he's like, let's do some Jedi stuff with them. So these baby Yodas, 
have been doing things like, well, I, my older one notices patterns. She's very smart. So the first thing they were doing was um, eating some uh, pirate booty on the sofa. That's good stuff. So she's like, oh, snack. And then they were had water guns, uh, spray bottles pointed at each other the next day. And she's like, attack, and which is on my mug, snack, attack. And then the last one is protect. Well, my husband forgot to set up protect. He's yelling at me going, Shakira, she's coming, she's coming. And so I'm like, oh my God. And I had like 90 seconds. So I grabbed some tape and I, oh, I'm in the kitchen. I grabbed tape and I grab a so, knife from the silverware drawer and I taped this knife around baby in his hand. And what was supposed to be super adorable looks like Chucky. Like it looks like he'd been on a murderous rampage the night before. And my kid goes, Mom, come quick, baby Yoda's got a knife. And it's not <laughs> even a butter knife. <laughs> <laughs> so again, they'll be in therapy for something. Yeah. <laughs> Give us something to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to take any more of you guys' time. It's the weekend. I've already had a couple of beers myself, so I've started. Yeah, I want to give you guys a chance to do that. Everybody should definitely go support Kareth on her social media sites or go to her website, as she said, kareth.com, or get the book. I'm flashing these things through. If you're on the podcast side, look in the show notes. That stuff will be in there. And just in general, thank you so much. And also a shout-out to Todd and EM Weekly. I know you guys, you guys did a podcast over there, so definitely go check out what Todd does because emergency management matters and he will help you get better at it, whether you're a professional or uh, a citizen who's like, I'm prepared. You're like, you are not prepared. So everybody can learn from Todd's work. Thank you so much, Todd. Uh, I'm going to be good here. Anything you all want to say in closing, I'm going to leave it to you and then we're going to sign off. I'm good. I just want to say thank you again. It's good to see you both. Hope to see you in real life very soon. Yeah, please. Yeah.